I'm here to talk to you about uh, electricity generation from wood chip, um, a little bit about what the possibilities are in terms of cogen and so forth. Um, so there's a few things I want to talk about. Um, firstly, why, why would you want to do this? What would be, what would be the point? Um, secondly, uh, what I'll do is I'll go through a little bit of an overview of how you do it. So how do you get electricity or power um, from wood chip? What is the process? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about on the electrical side of things, some of the things, just at a high level, um, what you have to think about um, if you do want to put in um, some electricity generation on your site. Um, and I'll go through a little bit of a brief look at costs as well. <coughs> All right, so money drives everything, doesn't it? So this is a graph of uh, electricity prices over the past 30, 40 years, um, separated into different components. Um, with the top sort of light blue, the colour is a bit hard to see, but the top light blue one, uh, if I can get the pointer, that one there, that's uh, retail price. So you can see that uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, we've all been stung pretty hard uh, in terms of the increase in, in retail price of electricity. Um, when it comes to wholesale prices, commercial and industrial and so forth, uh, it's not quite as bad. Um, prices have increased, um, but not by as much. Um, However, that may change also. Um, there's a lot of factors going into that. So, but anyway, the, the gist of the, the trend is that's, that's an upwards trend in, in all, all of the lines, basically, um, what you can see. So the idea is that, well, if you can generate some of your electricity yourself, um, you don't have to pay these uh, ever-increasing costs um, of electricity. <coughs> so, yeah, so it gives you some independence from the grid um, and allows you to reduce your power bill, essentially. Um, and you can do clever things, so you can really get the best of both worlds. So when the power price is low, um, for example, um, you can take the power from the grid. Uh, when the power price is high, uh, you can send, you can fire up your generator and send that power back into the grid and thereby reduce your bill uh, quite substantially. Um, so by doing that, um, you effectively, instead of being beholden to what the electricity retailer is going to charge you for your power, um, and being a price taker, uh, you become more of a price maker in a sense. Okay? So you control, have a little bit more control over the price you pay for electricity and a little bit more control over that risk of that escalation in price um, going forward. <coughs> All right, um, I just want to go through a couple of definitions just to clarify um, a few things. So there's a lot of sort of buzzwords that go around in, in the electrical industry anyway in terms of, um, so Cogeneration is a type of embedded generation, if you like. Um, people also talk in, about combined heat and power, so if you're in the process industry, that's probably more what you think of it as, as a CHP plant. Um, CHP uh, and cogeneration, it's the same thing, essentially. So you can use the terms interchangeably. I, I've sort of noticed a, prefer a preference for electrical engineers to refer to it as cogeneration, and maybe process engineers refer to it as CHP, but we're talking about the same thing. Um, also, something else to keep in mind, um, I'll talk about uh, megawatts E or megawatts electrical, um, obviously uh, different from uh, megawatts B, which is the megawatts or power you get from your boiler, um, or megawatts H, which is the heat out you get, and megawatts L, which is the losses. Okay, so this is a zero sum game. Um, you, your amount of electrical energy you get plus the amount of heat energy you get plus the losses has to equal the amount of output that's coming out of your boiler. Okay, so um, when you, if you decide to put in electrical cogeneration, you have to take away, most likely, some of your process heat. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, do you have spare process heat capacity that you can use for um, electricity generation? <coughs> All right. Um, so it is possible to generate, uh, the gist of the talk, I, really, I guess, is uh, it is possible to generate electricity and heat from wood waste. Okay. Um, this is what I said is called CHP or cogeneration. Um, you, the two main methods. Well, to, to my limited uh, chemical and process understanding. Okay, so you burn the wood in a boiler, um, you get steam, and you dry, use that to drive a turbine, which in turn drives um, electrical generator. Um, sort of conventional boiler system, which everyone's been talking about today so far. Um, the other process that uh, is less common, but is, I guess, gaining some more traction is called gasification, um, where you actually, is, it's also a combustion type process, but you end up with the output not being steam, but being like a syngas or a wood gas uh, that you use. You then burn that wood gas 
um, in a combustion engine to drive an electricity generator or you can even burn it just for heat. Um, so with boilers, uh, as we know, um, it's a well-proven technology. Um, there's millions of these things around the world, billions probably, um, a range of different sizes. Um, as far as using them for both heat and uh, electricity generation, there's not that many uh, in New Zealand, um, especially on the, on the sort of large scale. Um, obviously, the, the most probably well-known example is at Kinley, okay, in uh, the North Island. Um, that cogeneration plant's got a capacity of 39 megawatts electrical, which is which is actually less than their their plant demand. Okay, so it's not actually exporting any um, power to the grid. Um, the nice thing about conventional boilers, that probably should say conventional boilers, um, is that you know they're scalable so they can come from any size of course from kettle size you know your campfire type thing right up to huge power stations um, well established technology it's cheap it's proven it works <coughs> the other process uh, wood gasification um, a little bit different a little bit more involved um, you have some wood that comes in um, again i'm not an expert on the process that's involved but it's sort of a low level combustion i understand um, and out of that comes some kind of smoky uh, wood gas, which then gets filtered uh, and purified. Um, and you get, at the end of the process, you get what we call a wood gas or a syngas. Um, that wood gas or syngas can be, it has any number of uses. Um, you could potentially even sell it. Um, you can take it to a combustion engine. You can drive a, a generator that way. Um, you can burn it for heat um, and so forth. Um, there's a few benefits of gasification over, over conventional boilers. Okay, so there's generally less ash. Um, you get, it's more efficient, okay, so you get more energy output per unit of wood that you put in. Um, and uh, I understand that there's less pollution, okay, so less particulate emission and so forth, because it, just because the process involves more complete combustion. Um, it's a newer process, it's a newer technology, um, it's less proven and it's generally smaller scale at the moment, uh, hence it's a little bit more expensive um, and not many examples that I know of in New Zealand. However, uh, if you go overseas and look at Europe, uh, there are several companies that supply sort of off-the-shelf um, componentry. Um, wood gas these are wood gasifier um, cogen systems, okay, so um, there's a company in, in Europe called Pyrox which makes um, 0.5 to 1 megawatt electrical gas cogeneration system. So you get heat and you get electrical energy out of the system. Um, couldn't get a price off them, unfortunately, but uh, they have a website and they sell stuff. So I'm guessing it's available. I'm not sure if they can export it to New Zealand or not. <coughs> All right, so um, that's enough of about uh, the underlying technology. Uh, what I want to talk about now is a little bit about uh, the generation side of it and the electrical side of it. Um, won't be too detailed, it's sort of at a high level view. Um, when it comes to connecting generation, uh, electrical generation, the easiest option really is to make sure that your um, generator is sized less than, this, than the output of your plant. Okay, so if you have a five megawatt plant at minimum demand, then your generator, if it's sized less than five megawatts, um, you ensure that you're never exporting to the grid. Okay, um, and you don't want to, why you don't want to export to the grid probably is just to keep the net network utility happy. Okay? So if, if you start exporting to the grid, um, then the hoops and regulatory hurdles and things that you have to go through in order to get that piece of equipment connected are a little bit higher. Okay? The, the net utility starts to panic a little bit more when they realise that you're throwing energy into their system. Um, however, um, exporting to the grid does have some benefits. Um, first of all, you can get paid. Okay, so, and you can get paid in, in two ways. Um, firstly, you get paid for the energy that you produce. Um, and secondly, you get paid for um, reducing the load on their network. Okay, so this is what we call an avoided cost of transmission or avoided cost of distribution. Yeah, so um, you, it's almost like a double whammy. You get paid for your electricity and you get paid for helping them out um, in terms of their, their network. Um, the other nice thing about having some local on-site generation is that uh, it can be used as backup as well. So a sort of combined generation backup system. So in the case of the grid not being available for whatever reason, um, you can fire up your cogen plant and you've got some emergency backup, keep your process going uh, and so forth. 
Um, maybe not such a big deal in New Zealand because the grid's pretty reliable, um, but if you go uh, to the third world, outback Australia, Pacific Islands and so forth, this can be a game changer that you can actually keep things going if the grid fails when it's less reliable. Um, and a lot of these plants, if they're gas engines, they can also run on gas or diesel. So if you are concerned about fluctuating wood chip supply, um, you can have, you can run on diesel instead, you know, to keep things going. Obviously that's an expensive option, but uh, in an emergency it might prove uh, possible. <coughs> All right. Um, so if every uh, network diagram you showed uh, an audience, you tend to put two or three people to sleep. So I'll try and not spend too much time on this. Um, it's a very, very simple high level diagram of how it, how it works uh, in terms from an electrical point of view um, for your cogeneration plant. Uh, essentially you have uh, local lines utility, uh, that in New Zealand is typically about 33 kV voltage level. Um, supply transformer um, supplies a main switchboard. From that main switchboard you have your normal uh, local service switchboards and your process drives, fans, pumps, conveyors and so forth. All of this stuff here is stuff that you normally have uh, on site. Okay, so it's, there's no real change there. So all you're doing when you're putting a cogeneration plant is you're adding this guy here, which is a cogeneration plant or generator to your system. Um, I've si simplistically shown it just connecting straight to the main switchboard. That's often what occurs, but normally some length of cable or something to you know, actually run it out to connect it to where it is on site. Um, sometimes there's another transformer, different voltage levels and so forth. It just really depends on um, what's on site, what you have at the moment, what you do and what's available. There's a few other things to think about um, as well uh, when you if you decide to go down this path. Um, so you obviously you need to think about what your balance is between your process heat and your electrical output. You know, do you want mainly process heat and a little bit of electricity or do you want mainly electricity and a little bit of process heat? Um, or, or do you want some kind of combination where you have the ability to, to vary it depending on your process? Um, how does that generation, how's it going to mesh with your existing supply? So in a retrofit case, you're coming into an existing network, you know, is there space? Um, is there, you know, what are the local voltage levels? What are the constraints on the local supply, cables, etc.? Um, these are all things you have to think about. Um, a bit of a buzzword in the electrical industry at the moment is uh, arc flash hazard. Okay, so it's a big safety issue. Um, essentially this is uh, what happens when you have fault on a switchboard or on a piece of equipment. It generates a big flash of, of light and heat. It's basically like a bomb going off um, caused by the uh, electricity. Um, Obviously you don't want that to happen and you don't want anyone to be around when that happens. Um, people die um, all the time from arc flash hazards. Um, so if you're putting in a local generator, uh, it does have the impact of significantly raising your local fault levels, um, which leads to a bigger bomb, essentially. Um, however, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's lots of ways in which you can mitigate this risk. Okay, so there's fancy types of protection that you can put in, arc flash protection. Um, there's you know, fault current limiting reactors and there's, other, and there's lots of other um, process things you can do in order to minimise that risk in terms of stopping people from being exposed to that, that type of problem. But it's just something you have to think about um, as opposed to just having a normal site with no on-site generation. You want to keep your electrical utility happy? Um, <laughs> Generally, uh, if you fight with them, your life's a lot harder. Yeah. So, um, is is the generation that you put on site? Are you just going to connect and not tell them about it, and then they're going to ring you up and say, "Oh, you're causing all kinds of havoc on our network." Um, <laughs> that's probably not going to work out in the long run because um, they ultimately they control the switches and they can they can switch you off. Um, so you have to figure out: is it going to cause them problems or? Um, are you actually going to cause them a net benefit? And if that's the case, um, then you, you can sell this to them and they can pay you for it or they should pay you for it. Um, you know, will it cause fault level problems in their network, um, coordination issues with protection um, and so forth? Um, <coughs> all of this really uh, that I've been talking about is, you know, sort of with a sales hat on here. Um, you really want to get in touch with your consultant, your electrical consultant, um, and so we can help um, discuss these issues with, with the local utility. We understand it from um, both a, a network point of view and from a local 
industrial point of view and um, we can sort of be like a mediator in, in these types of discussions. All right, a little bit about costs. Um, these are for, I should say, these are for, these are capital costs for um, greenfield installed sites, not retrofits, okay? So um, retrofits, different kettle of fish I didn't uh, look into. Um, but what I, what I discovered in my, in my research was that the installation cost for, for capital um, greenfield sites varies widely, okay? So um, and a lot of it depends on the technology that you use um, and also just you know, where you are in the world, I think. Um, what the local expertise is and so forth. Um, so, for, as I said earlier, if you're doing a gasification system, um, you're looking at you know, quite high costs in terms of capital costs in order of $10 million a megawatt type of for an installed plant, um, pretty eye-watering. However, conventional boilers, you know, you're looking at a $1 million a megawatt through to sort of 5 or $6 million a megawatt. So, wide range of costs, but um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you want to do gasification, you're probably looking at $100 million uh, for a 10 megawatt, 10 megawatt gasification plant. That's 10 megawatts electrical, so you get process heat out of that in excess of that, but uh, even so, it's a big cost. Um, boiler option, probably, probably a lot cheaper, probably half of that um, cost, uh, that I should say conventional boiler. Um, however, you have to keep this in mind with the cost of electricity. Yeah. So. This is, and this is the wholesale price, okay? So I'm not sure how many of you have a situation where you are paying the wholesale price, if you are, lucky you. Um, but uh, if, if you're paying the wholesale price uh, at Invercargill um, in 2014, this is average at $73 a megawatt hour, okay? If you had a plant that drew nine megawatts continuously, that energy throughout the year, um, that's gonna cost you near enough to $6 million over the course of a year. Okay, just the energy cost, just the electrical cost. Um, you can do the numbers on that. Um, if you look at a capitalised cost of that over 20 years, that's, you're looking at around $60 million um, for a 9, nine megawatt. That's just your electricity cost. All right, so there's a consortium in the UK that's building a 9 megawatt gasification plant uh, in Northamptonshire. Um, the still cost of that is $112 million. Okay, so you can see that, okay, it's double the electricity cost, more or less. Um, maybe for a boiler, um, conventional boiler, you're getting in the ballpark of this being cost effective. Yeah, so, 65 million. However, um, it's not the whole story. Um, so, this line here is the 2014 wholesale cost, 70 odd dollars a megawatt hour. Um, that wholesale cost, that is it's an average over a year. And you've got to remember that that varies, the standard deviation on that's about $80. So that varies anywhere from negative prices right up to two, $300 a megawatt hour quite, quite regularly. Okay, so um, if you get more clever about how you schedule your generation and where, when it's operating and when you're taking power from the grid and when you're sending power to the grid, um, you can actually do much better um, than that um, because of the smarts and, and when you put the energy in. So you can see that this line here sort of looks at the capitalised cost of energy um, as the wholesale price goes up. Um, so I'm not one of these people who think that the electricity price is going to uh, go down uh, in future years. Okay, I, I only think it's going up. Um, but it's always dangerous looking at past, past trends and extrapolating, of course, but you can see from that first slide that I showed you, uh, it's going up. Um, there's a lot of drivers behind why it's going up. Probably not time to get into them here, um, but I, the short run story is I don't think you're going to be paying less for your electricity um, years going ahead. So um, right now, what I'm saying is that I think it's bordering on economic to put a greenfield um, conventional boiler system in, cogeneration system, like for like electricity. Gasification probably not, but who knows what happens with the electricity price, what's going to happen in, in years to come. Um, also, you have to keep in mind um, we have to do something with the wood chip, okay? So and, and wood waste. So are we going to burn it? We're going to send it to landfill. What are we going to do with it? Okay. So if you burn it, it's, it's a good use for it. Um, as I mentioned, um, the electricity price is very volatile. Okay. 
Okay, so if you have some control over that locally, that really mitigates a, a, a risk you have as a business. Um, I don't think electricity prices are going to fall. In fact, I think they'll probably rise faster than CPI going forward. Um, it's also possible that, you know, as, as demonstrated from a gathering like this today, there's a lot of know-how here um, in New Zealand, a lot of can-do attitude. You know, maybe um, we can get something locally going in terms of a, a cogeneration system here that we can do cheaper than, than in the UK. Um, and I think there's, there's great opportunity um, for that um, if you sort of a, a consortium or a co collaboration in terms of people getting something on the ground. Um, and none of this, um, of course, as was mentioned in the previous talk, is talking about carbon price emissions. Yeah? So that's, that's the huge elephant in the room. You know, if we have some certainty over carbon price that comes out of Paris at the end of the year, um, and that whacks an extra, that, that's going to whack, that could whack an extra $20 a megawatt hour on the electricity price straight away. Who knows? Um, probably not so much in New Zealand because we're mostly hydro, but you know, certainly around the rest of the world, uh, we could see the effect it had in Australia. Um, it it put, the, put the wholesale price up by $10, $20 a megawatt hour um, when they put that on. Um, and that's, that's a real cost. You have to pay that still. Um, and um, yeah, is it enough? I don't know. Um, let's see what happens. Let's wait and see with the carbon space. But um, you know, wood, wood energy is a sustainable source of energy. Um, I think we should be using more of it. All right, um, so just to summarise, um, gone through a couple of different types of wood electricity systems. Um, I think boiler solute, conventional boiler systems probably getting on the realm of economic at today's costs. Um, gasification uh, systems, probably not, um, but who knows what's going to happen in a few years um, as that technology matures and so forth. Um, and you know, get in touch with your electrical consultant um, if you're interested in doing this kind of stuff. Get in touch early. Um, there's a lot of design issues and things that need to be thought about um, ahead of time. Better to do it earlier rather than later. It's, it saves you money in the long run.